Uh, and it's my pleasure to be introducing our speaker tonight, Dr. Beth Shapiro. Uh, she moved her paleogenomics lab, I'm going to leave it to her to explain what paleogenomics is, uh, from Penn State University last year, right? Yeah. Last year, uh, here to UC Santa Cruz, where she's an associate professor in the ecology and evolutionary biology department. And I remember when I first saw her give a talk, I think a couple years ago, I was extremely impressed because she works with ancient DNA, basically extracting DNA from fossils. And I am also a geneticist and I have a hard enough time working with DNA from living animals. So <laughs> I was very, very impressed. And I'm really excited to hear her talk today about de de-extinction. Some of you may have seen her TEDx talk that was part of the de-extinction series. If you have not, go YouTube it. It's online. And uh, what else? Uh, so you're going to be talking about the mammoth today, I believe. Um, I hope you also talk about the passenger pigeon as well, because I'm very interested in hearing about that. And without further ado, Ben Shapiro. Well, thanks to uh, Weiser and Science Justice Working Group for inviting me to come here and speak to everyone. I have a, a normal kind of talk prepared here, but um, what I'm going to do is talk a little bit about how I got involved in working with ancient DNA and what that really means, and then talk a little bit about the extinction itself, what that means, how it works, how close we are to making it happen. And then in the end, just try to open it up to a little bit of discussion. So, um, do we think de extinction is a good idea? And if so, why? Or why not? And what species should we actually bring back from the dead if we are going to go about doing such a crazy thing? Um, so, I've titled the talk uh, De Extinction Could We, Would We, Should We? And this is pretty much how I've divided up the talk to describe these three different topics. So, could we? would we and shouldn't we? So most of the time, uh, my research actually focuses on extinction. So trying to use DNA sequences that we can isolate from the bones and tissue and teeth of things that used to be alive. And we look at the amount of genetic diversity that existed in populations of things like mammoths and bison and horses in the past, and we compare it to the amount of diversity that exists today. And we ask questions like, why did these populations go extinct? Why did they increase in genetic diversity or decrease in genetic diversity? What was the role of the ice ages or the introduction of human hunters into an ecosystem in driving some species extinct and others not? And uh, so, but today I'm not going to talk about that stuff. Today I'm going to talk about the opposite side of that, which is de extinction. This is not my day job, I should say. Um, I am not working on bringing any animals back to life, um, mainly because it's not possible, uh, and also because uh, um, it's a crazy idea. <laughs> there is, however, someone in my lab whose sole purpose in life is to bring the passenger pigeon back to life, and uh, he's sitting here today, that's Ben, if you have any questions about the passenger pigeon, including why, <laughs> you can ask him later. Um, the idea is crazy, and... Uh, so is Ben. Um, <laughs> but that's all right, right? So, the extinction. So, to open it up, who knows what uh, David Attenborough, B.D. Wong, have to do with the extinction? For Attenborough, right? That's on my table. Oh, and for B.D. Wong. That's right, he was the scientist who brought the dinosaurs back to life. So, uh, yes, so opening it up with here with the crazy, right? Jurassic Park is pretty crazy, so we should know right off the back the bat that, speaking of bat, anyone know the score of the, the game that's on there? <laughs> Still, no, 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 no? Six. Boss? Okay, so that's going to be up soon. <laughs> All right, we um, cannot get DNA from dinosaurs. So this is just a fact, and I'm sorry especially to anyone here who's about under 15, who might have thought that bringing dinosaurs back from the dead were gonna be, was going to be the most exciting achievement ever. We can't get DNA from dinosaurs. DNA survives a maximum amount of time, about 
a million or so years, probably. The oldest DNA we've been able to get out of anything is 700,000 years old. There's a horse that whose bone we collected from the Arctic. It was frozen in the dirt, frozen dirt, called permafrost, and, and it was really well preserved, and we were able to get DNA from that, but nothing older than that. And who knows when the dinosaurs went extinct? Anyway? 65 million years ago. No, 65 million years ago, yeah. So that's way too old for recovering DNA. No dinosaurs. Sorry. So what can we bring back to life, or what is within the range of what we can actually access? So. I do uh, most of my work in the Arctic, and this is because when we're in the Arctic, DNA survives really well. While I'm there, we tend to stay in five-star accommodations such as this. You see the, uh, the beautiful scenery here, and all of these nice black dots, those are mosquitoes. Um, so there are, there are a few mosquitoes in, in the Arctic that you have to try to avoid breathing um, in, in a typical day. We find quite a lot of remains. This is, um, this is from an expedition we were on in, in Chukotka. Um, this picture was taken by Lova Thalen, a friend of mine who works in Uppsala. And this is a bunch of mammoth and woolly rhino and some bison remains that they found in Uppsala. And these bones, uh, the Arctic is, is pretty similar across, uh, all the way spanning from kind of Arctic Europe all the way across Siberia and into North America. We work in all these different places, going out during the day and collecting bones. The location we work in is called Beringia. You see this kind of this, this light coloration here. This is a lower sea level. And all of this area here connecting Siberia into Alaska is called Beringia. So this, in case you aren't used to seeing a map of this projection here, this is Alaska. This is the part of the world that Sarah Palin can see through her backyard. <laughs> and, <laughs> and this is the land bridge that lots of different species, including our own, used to move from one continent to another. So during the Ice Ages, the sea level was a lot lower than it is today because a lot of the water was taken up into glaciers that were forming across the continents, on top of the continents. And that exposed this land area here. And, and importantly, during the Ice Ages, this part of the world was not glaciated. Instead, it was a really rich tundra grassland that supported an equally rich diversity of Ice Age animals and plants, including some of these guys that you see here. Now today, most of these are extinct, but when we go up and work in these places, we find a lot of really well-preserved remains. And here you see some mammoth, whoops, mammoth tusks, and this is a horse. Uh, um, this is a mandible, I believe, or a maxilla. And this is permafrost, so frozen dirt, like where we found these different soils. And a lot of the work we're doing right now is in the Yukon Territory. If anybody has seen Gold Rush or these National Geographic films that are talking about uh, people hunting for gold up in the Yukon, these are the people we work with to find these bones. So in order to get to the gold, they're trying to wash away this frozen dirt that sits above it to get to the gravels underneath where the gold is. And inside this frozen dirt, there are thousands of these bones. And so we go up here and we work with the gold miners and collect the bones that are coming out of this frozen dirt. They think we're kind of nuts, but we stand around and collect the, the bones and we take them back and uh, extract their DNA. So in the last decade or so, uh, myself and colleagues around the world have extracted DNA from a whole bunch of these animals and we've learned how species like bison and horses responded to the Ice Age. We've watched mammoths go extinct and brown bears expand enormously about 35,000 years ago and, and kind of colonize all across Asia, establishing new populations as they're following these giant populations of things that are now extinct. And we ask questions about why some species like the North American lions and saber-toothed cats have got extinct, while others, including the caribou, continue to do so well. And no matter how excited we are about the results that we've come up with, no matter how groundbreaking we think the stuff that we are publishing is, the only question we ever get asked by the media <laughs> is, when are we going to have a clone a mammoth? Can we have a clone a mammoth now? Has it come to clone a mammoth? Well, no. <laughs> and you can imagine that it was a couple of months ago now that this these, uh, Korean team reported that they had discovered this mammoth um, preserved up in the very far north of Siberia, and New Siberian Islands, I think, that had blood, actual blood. <laughs> you can imagine that the first thing that the media wanted to know was, 
Does this mean we're going to be able to clone a mammoth? We got blood now, right? Does this mean we're going to be able to clone a mammoth? So the answer is still no. And to, to really explain why the answer is still no, let's talk a little bit about cloning. All right, so... A while ago now, 1996, you guys will remember having heard about Dolly the Sheep being cloned, right? You remember Dolly? This happened in, in Scotland. And these researchers were trying to uh, clone a sheep, and the way that they were going to know that they had cloned sheep was that the breed of sheep that they were cloning looked different from the mom that they were putting this clone into. So when it was born, they were going to know whether it was the clone, which looked a lot different, or the mom, right? So they look different from each other, so you can tell when they're born. And the way they did this was they took... So we have two different types of cells in our bodies. We have uh, somatic cells, which are all the s tissues, all of the cells in all of our tissues, mostly. And we have gametes. These are eggs and sperm. Eggs and sperm and somatic cells, right? So what they wanted to do is take a somatic cell. In this case, they took um, mammary cells from this donor mom, who was a thin dorset you, and they stressed them out. They stressed them out by not feeding them, not giving them any nutrients, and in essence what they did was they made them forget what kind of cell they were. They forgot that they were mammary cells, and they went back to a kind of early state, a pre-differentiation state, a pre-knowing what their job as a cell was kind of state. And they took these totally stressed out cells, and they removed the nucleus from them. They removed the part of the cell that has the genome in it. At the same time, they took some egg cells from the mom, who was a Scottish blackface, and they removed the nucleus from those cells. So now they had an egg with no nucleus and a totally stressed out nucleus that didn't know what its job was. And they stressed this stuff out again. They zapped it with some electricity. And that caused this totally stressed out, forgot what its job was kind of cell to dump inside this empty nucleus, dumped it in there. And then they zapped it again and it went, whoa, <laughs> I got a job to do, let me figure out what to do. And it started to differentiate. It became all the different types of cells that it needed to become to become a fully formed uh, thin dorset sheep. And Dolly was born. So this, this is a magical process. It's called somatic cell nuclear transfer. At the time, they didn't really know why it worked. That was discovered later, and there was a Nobel Prize that was shared for this discovery of how to make these cells forget what they were doing. They made induced pluripotent stem cells. That just means it's a cell that can become any other type of cell in the body. They made induced pluripotent stem cells. They, they did it by um, using a cocktail of different enzymes, transcription factors that they incubate with the cell and then it makes it work. It's not that important to know this. But what is important is that all these different things that we're talking about, somatic cell nuclear transfer, these are uh, immunopluripotent stem cells. It's just another type of stem cell, an embryonic stem cell. That's the natural cell that becomes every type of cell in the body. The important thing about all this is that it has, the, it all has these, these seeds in it. The C, C. That, that means a cell, right? A whole intact living cell, right? But where we have bones or teeth or mummies, or some gloopy substance that someone might think is blood but isn't blood, there are no cells, because the cells have started to decay immediately. When something is dead, when something is found after it's dead, no matter how long it's been dead, there are no cells. And where there are no cells, there are no clones. So, we cannot clone a mammoth. The end. <laughs> Just kidding, obviously. That would be a really short, boring talk. Um, okay, so, okay, we don't have any cells. So we don't have any there. We don't have any cells. So, can we actually clone something then, given that we don't have any cells and we can't use the process called somatic cell nuclear transfer? So what do we have to do? And, and to describe this, I'm going to go through what I call the seven, almost, steps of de-extinction. So the first thing we need to do is we need to sequence the genome. Now this is just a long string of A's, C's, G's, and T's in a particular order that spells out the genes that make the proteins that make the animal look and act the way that the animal looks. This is the first step that we need to do. And we, we kind of know how to do that. And then we have to take that and we need to stick it onto the chromosome. So these are the machines that actually carry the genome around. This is a karyotype from a human male. This is the X and the little Y there. You know that men have a lot less DNA than women? Yeah? 
explains a lot, doesn't it? Um, <laughs> While you're faster, yes. <laughs> So anyway, we need to figure out how to turn these DNA sequences into chromosomes, and um, we don't know how to do that. And then we have to get the chromosomes into the nucleus of the cell and make them turn on and start doing the things that chromosomes do. And we don't know how to do that. And then we need to get that nucleus into the cell. This we know how to do. This is somatic cell nuclear transfer. And then after we've done that, we have to find a surrogate mom to carry this thing to term. You're laughing, but this is actually a really important step. You know, given the difference in size between the much larger mammoth and the much smaller but closely related Asian elephant, the actual process of bringing an embryo mammoth to term as a living, breathing mammoth could be disastrous, <laughs> explosive, <laughs> Disgusting? Anyway, after we figured out how to do that and give birth to an actual baby mammoth, we then have to find a place for the mammoth to live so it can go about living and surviving and reproducing and carrying on in its regular life. And, and that's also going to be quite a, a difficult thing to accomplish. I have a big yard off. Or easy, right? Depending on how you want to look at it. So um, what do we know so far? Where are we in this steps of de-extinction if we're thinking about a mammoth? Well, the first attempt to sequence a mammoth genome was um, published a couple years ago. And in this publication, they sequenced about 3 billion bases of mammoth DNA, translated to about 50% of the mammoth genome. So we know about 50% of the mammoth genome. So instead of this, what we have is more like this. But that's not bad. That was state-of-the-art a few years ago. It's state-of-the-art pretty much today. There's no more details that we know about the mammoth genome right now. But this is quite a lot of information. So, in fact, does anybody know how many complete mammalian or eukaryotic, let's stick with mammalian, genomes have been published? How many genomes are known? How many complete genomes do we know? Anybody? Five? Anybody else? One? Twenty? We're just kind of going all over the place here, aren't we? We've seen genomes published, right? Actually, none. Yeah. None. Including our own, which we have lots and lots and lots of data. We still do not know the complete genome sequence of even our own species. I'm, I'm being a little bit unfair here. We do know the complete sequence of the chromatin, and this is the part of the genome where the genes live. The genes are the things that make us look and act the way we do. The part that we don't know is called heterochromatin. This stuff is found toward the middle of the cells, toward the centromeres, and toward the ends of the, sorry, the chromosomes, toward the ends of the chromosomes as well. And this is just a, a bunch of tightly packed repeat sequences, which is really hard to sequence through and to actually know how many repeats there are. So we don't know if these are important in making a human or any other species look and act the way they do, but we don't know. We don't know what's in them. We don't know the sequences of them yet. So we want to go from this, our 50% mammoth genome, to a population of mammoths living in the wild. So how do we do that? Well, the first step, obviously, is going to be finish the genome. So we go out into the field and we find really well-preserved... Let me just bring back here. Do you see how there's not a window here? <laughs> or there? You might think that that's a bad thing, but it's not because... Well, in this... Do you see how this is the gas tank? <laughs> the inside of this helicopter has two of these massive gas tanks that stick out toward the... And we had all of our gear packed on these things. And we got on this helicopter four different times in this particular expedition to try to get out into the field in the Tamir Peninsula. And um, the fourth time we got out, it actually took off. This was an exciting moment in this expedition. And when we got finally got high enough in the air so we knew that we could actually start moving, the um, French people who were leading the expedition and the Russians decided it was a good time to have a celebratory smoke. <laughs> yeah, I'm glad there were windows. And that it didn't explode. Anyway, moving on. We take a really good sample and we bring it back to the lab and we extract the DNA. And then we have another problem. So, Ancient DNA, it's not that much fun to work with, and here are a couple reasons why. If I were to take one of my own hairs, for example, and 
take it, mm -hmm. grind it up, dissolve it up, extract its DNA, and sequence it. Sequence everything that ended up in that DNA extract. Almost all of it would be my own DNA. That's because my DNA is in good condition. There's nothing wrong with my hair. You know, it's, it, it, I'm not contaminated with anything. It's all, it's all going to be my DNA. That's not what happens with ancient things. So this is an example, this is a real example from a mammoth bone that we collected from the Alaskan permafrost and we extracted and we sequenced. And looking at all the different DNA sequences that were in that extract, about half of it turned out to be mammoth DNA. Half of it mapped to the elephant genome, which is how we guessed it was mammoth DNA. The other half was mostly bacteria and viruses and um, fungi and all sorts of things that live in the soil. So once that bone is buried, the bone starts to be colonized by all sorts of other things that have DNA. Fungi grow on it, bacteria start to decay. You pick it up and your own DNA gets in that bone. So when you sequence it, it's a mixture of all that different stuff. And the first thing you have to do is tease apart which part of it is mammoth and which part of it is just to throw away. Now, 50% is actually pretty good. Here's another example of um, what happens here. This is a Neanderthal bone that was used to sequence the complete Neanderthal genome, the first one that was published. And you see here that about 3% of the sequences in there actually mapped to primate, and that would have included both Neanderthal DNA and any human DNA that had gotten into it when people were touching that bone or actually making that DNA extract, doing the work. The rest of it was unidentified environmental stuff, all stuff that you expect to find in that bone because the bone has been buried in the ground for a long time. So the first challenge is actually to find out how much in that extract actually is something you're interested in and pull it out of that giant soup of nonsense that you're actually extracting. This is solvable. All we have to do is sequence it a lot. If only three out of every 100 sequences we get are the thing we're looking for, then we just have to sequence it a lot, lot more than we would if it were human. But then we have the second problem. So if you think of modern DNA as uh, very long strands of lovely high quality DNA, things that are just in, in really good condition and, and all the DNA can be extracted as really, really long fragments. Ancient DNA is more like, to keep going with this particular analogy here, would be more like the kind of confetti that comes out of one of those party poppers. You know, you pull the thing and the confetti goes everywhere. Um, after that confetti was run over by a herd of mammoths <laughs> in the rain <laughs> on a bad day. It's really bad. It's in terrible condition. It's decayed. It's got different chemical damages on it that you have to be able to sort through. It's got all sorts of junk. There's bits and pieces folded over and cross-linked together that you can't get apart. And it's, an, it's a mess. It's a really hard thing to actually work with. So how do we do any of it at all? Um, well, what we can do is we find the thing that is still alive, for which we have a good genome, and we just try to map everything we get out of that bone or tooth or tissue to what it is. So with an, a mammoth, we can use the elephant genome, and we can say how many of these sequences match the elephant genome, and we can use that as a, as a scaffold or a map on which we can try to piece together that mammoth genome. And for the Neanderthal, of course, we can use the human, where we have a pretty good genome, and we can say how many bits of these, this kind of crappy, horrible DNA that I've gotten out of this Neanderthal don't map to the human genome. And this is great, except it's harder the more distantly related the species is that we're trying to actually assemble the genome. So for the human and the Neanderthal, we only diverged about half a million years ago. It's a pretty easy way to match these things up. For the mammoth and the elephant, they probably diverged about three million years ago. It's a bit harder. And for the passenger pigeon, whose closest living relative is the band-tailed pigeon, that divergence probably happened more like 15 or 20 million years ago. And the longer evolution has had to make these things look different more and more different from each other, the harder it is to match up those DNA sequences. Because not only do you have mutation and evolution that, that changes the sequence itself, but also the genome becomes rearranged. The chromosomes change, genes move around, the number of chromosomes change, and the more and greater these differences are, the harder it is to actually use these living things 
as a scaffold on which to map these ancient genomes. So this is not a, an easy process. But, and this is where some of this real new recent innovation comes in to, to helping us out here. What if we don't actually need to know the genome sequence? What if we don't actually have to sequence that entire genome? What if we don't have to go through all of this crazy process of piecing together this bunch of nonsense that we've pulled out of these bones and make something else? And in fact, there are some technologies that have recently been developed that are allowing us to hone in on the part of the genome that we're especially interested in. And that would be, I would say, the genes. So the genes in our genome make up only about 1% to 2% of the actual ACs, Gs, and Ts that are there. So in humans, we have uh, about 3.5 billion ACs, Gs, and Ts making our genome, but only 1% to 2% of these are actually coding for stuff, are actually making proteins that make us look and act the way that we do. The rest of it is other stuff. 8% of that heterochromatin that we can't sequence through, there's lots of retro elements, these are viruses that got into our genome, they make up about half of our genome, they're just using us as a way of surviving and living, not really doing anything to us, you know, there's lots of stuff in there that is not that important to make us, well, that we know about, to make us look and act the way we do. So what if we can focus in on this 1-2% to and identify the specific changes that make us different from Neanderthals, that make mammoths different from elephants, that make the passenger pigeon different from the band-tailed pigeon, find these and then change those, then we don't have to know the whole genome sequence. We could just go in, find the bit of the genome that we want to change, and then use one of these fancy new technologies that exist to be able to actually do genome editing and engineering. Now, these things have been developed with human medical applications in mind and also with agricultural applications in mind. And these are ways that scientists have developed to go in and make very specific changes to the genome. This is how it works. So here is a DNA sequence. It's, it's uh, oops, let me back up here so I can explain it. Here's a DNA sequence. It's a part of the chromosome here. And let's just say that there's a change right here that we want to make. So let's say this is a gene that's doing something important that we know what it is. And we know that the mammoth is different by one, one A, C, G, or T. And it's right there. So what we can do is we can design these little, like, they're like bugs that we can insert into the cell and then they can identify that specific place in the genome that we want to change and they make a cut. They cut it in half and then the instructions are in here to actually replace this, this say it's a T, that replace that T right there with the letter that we want to replace it. So we're changing only that one base and in making this change we've changed this elephant version of the gene to the mammoth version of the gene. So what we've done here is we've taken the elephant genome and we've made it look a little bit more like a mammoth genome without knowing the entire sequence of the mammoth genome. And if we could do that for all the differences that are important in making a mammoth look something different than an elephant, then we could use this technology without having any intact cells, which we know we don't have once things are extinct. So the big question there, then, is what do we change? How do we know what we're actually supposed to change to make an elephant look more like a mammoth? How do we know what are the important bits of the genome that we can target with this technology? We know that in some, in, in humans and chimpanzees, and here we have a gratuitous picture of my youngest son, Henry, um, compared to this very adorable chimpanzee child. <laughs> And these two guys have 98% identical genomes. So if we just want to go in there and figure out what that 2% of the genome is that makes these things different, we can use this technology to change that 2%, actually manipulating using modern existing technology, existing technology, into turning this genome into uh, the other species. So as an example of something that we do know differs between humans and elephants, there's a gene pathway called MC1R. It's a, it's a part of the genome that makes things, makes hair different colors. Um, so we know that there's a mutation, or a few mutations in MC1R that make humans have pale skin and red hair. And we know that the ex what, what the mutations do is change the amount of proteins that are expressed from this particular gene. So if we look at mammoths, um, this is a, some work that was done by Michi Hofreiter and some people from the uh, Institute in Leipzig, who are some friends and collaborators. 
of mice, and we found that there were two different alleles, two different varieties of this gene that were circulating in the mouse. That if that the female would have twice as much of any protein that's made by the X as any male. So evolution, in order to solve this problem, turns off one of the X chromosomes. X turned off in every one of her cells, and so is the same color all the way around. Does not have a chance to be calico. So, little side effect. Even a complete genetic clone is not going to look or act the same as the parent. There are other interspecific clones. There's been a dog called Snoopy, and there's this bull called Second Chance. His dad, mom, dad, was called Chance. <laughs> See? Good puns. Uh, all, all sorts of other things that have been cloned. Here's an interesting one. There was a, a in 2001, I think, um, a whole herd of cattle was cloned, but using this technology to actually manipulate the genes, they were actually cloned to m express the human albumin protein instead of the bovine version of that albumin protein. So this, they produced milk that was easier to digest for Cubans because they were expressing the human version of that gene. Kind of creepy, huh? And then we also have have done clones, um, made clones of different species that uh, who were born to different species. So this is a bantang. Whoops, a ban. Go back, go back. A bantang that was born to a cow in Idaho, and this bantang is now alive uh, in the San Diego Zoo. And I think he's like four or five years old and, and doing quite well. And so there have been a couple of these uh, species that were actually born to a different species parent. And this is not just a breed, like in Dolly the Sheep, but actually a different species. But none of these are examples of de-extinction, because these are all animals that were cloned from other living animals, so where we did have cells. There is one example of the de-extinction that happened, but this is kind of cheating again, and you'll see why. Uh, Bucardo is a type of ibex that lived in the mountains in Spain, and um, Celia here was the last of the Bucardo, this particular ibex who was alive. She was an old female, the last one of her species, and while she was still alive she was captured and some cells were harvested from one of her ears. So they got some somatic cells and they used these to make embryos that they were going to use to try to raise in a different species. And so they collected, so they, they blindfolded her to make sure she wasn't so stressed out when they were taking her cells. And um, they tried to uh, put these cells into Ibex, but um, they don't really like being around people and they do like climbing precariously high ledges. <laughs> And it was very difficult for the people who were trying to do this to actually get these guys to do the artificial insemination because they were hiding on ledges in the building. And so they, they ab abandoned this particular strategy and decided they were going to use domestic goats and they, didn't, they couldn't get it to work. They actually couldn't get any of the embryos to go to, to, to any pregnancies to actually take. Um, so they hybridized a domestic goat with an ibex and got something that they could handle as well as was more closely related to this particular ibex and they tried many um, I think there were several hundred different embryos that they tried to implant. They had 13 of them that actually went to pregnancy, and one individual was born. I should say, in the meantime, before this happened, um, they got a, a signal from the radio collar that they put on Celia that was a single solid beep that had indicated that she had died, and she had actually been crushed by a falling tree, which was the extinction of that species. That subspecies. And anyway, um, this uh, long ordeal, difficult ordeal, uh, um, ended with the birth of uh, a Bucardo who lived for eight minutes before dying of uh, respiratory failure. It had an, an extra globe in its lung that caused it to die. So um, there was a lot. I, I would say that, that in this particular story, um, what, what we... What I take from this is that there is not just uh, human curiosity and technical challenges associated with this, but there are animal welfare issues to be considered when thinking about de-extinction and using other species and bringing things back. And we need to carefully consider why we're doing this before going about doing it. 
Recently, um, there was a report from a group from Australia, like that guy called Mike Archer, that they had managed to get some cells to grow from a frog called the Lazarus frog. It's a, a gastric brooding frog. These guys, um, the the they swallow their eggs after they're born, and then the tadpoles actually live in the stomachs for about six weeks before they throw them up as fully formed frogs, which is a, an interesting adaptation to a very harsh time of life for a frog. Anyway, these guys are extinct. There were two species of them, but they managed to get uh, some embryos to actually grow. They weren't able to, to bring them to, to actually have a frog or a tadpole that came to fruition, but they have gotten pretty far with this. And, and the, the cool thing about this is that they're using cells for this tissue culture. They're using cells that were in a regular conventional freezer for about 30 years. So this is really pushing the amount of time that a cell, a surviving cell that can be revived and actually do something has existed. And th I, this is just to say that this has worked done by a lot of different people who were involved in a lot of different cloning projects. I'll tell you a little bit about them right now. As far as genome editing, there is an effort to use genome editing to bring back the passenger pigeon and the mammoth. Um, there's a process called rewilding, and they're using something called backbreeding. So these people in Europe are really interested in bringing back the auroch, which is an extinct species of cow, the progenitor of all the of many of the modern cow species. And so what they're doing is actually finding cows that look more like the old thing and forcing them to breed. So they're they're bringing this thing back by just kind of na artificially selecting for um, phenotypes and behaviors that remind them of the thing that's extinct. So is this de-extinction? Possibly the extinction it depends what you what you think about. Of course, the, the mammoth project. So finally, the the last part, and then hope to open it up a little bit to discussion. So, so should we should we bring it back? And this is a this is a hugely um, opinionated uh, question here. Um, this is I'm not uh, I I obviously have my own opinion, but I'm hoping to chat to you guys about what your opinions are. And to get into this, I thought that I would just start with a few of the questions that immediately come to my mind. And uh, I think I'm going to have a drink of beer first. <laughs> okay, so. <coughs> Should we bring extinct species back to life? Well, if we do, if we decide that it's a good idea to bring something back to life, who gets to make the decision about what species we bring back to life? Who here has an idea about what species they'd like to see brought back? <laughs> yeah? Pretty much everybody that I've asked that question, if they thought about it for a few minutes, could go, oh yeah, I want to bring this thing back. But who gets to decide? Is it something that we should vote on? Is it something that you know politicians are going to get to decide? Is it something that scientists should get to decide? Is it somebody who's going to make money on bringing this thing back to life gets to decide? Ben, should Ben get to decide? Because then we're going to end up with passenger pigeons, and honestly, I think that's a terrible idea. Try and stop me. If we do bring an extinct species back to life, and we use this genome editing thing, or if we don't use the genome editing thing, and we actually do manage to sequence the entire genome and figure out how to turn it on and make it act like a normal thing, is it going to be the thing that it was? Or by bringing it back in this different environment, is it automatically something else? Is it really ever going to be a de-extinct thing? How much of a genome do we have to bring back in order for it to be a mammoth compared to an elephant? If we get 2% of the genome, is it a mammoth? If we get 50% of the genome, is it a mammoth? If we get 90% of the genome, is it a mammoth? What does it mean? What does it mean to say you brought something back to life? What is it, then, once we've brought it back? It's extinct, but then not extinct. So is it classified as an endangered species, or is it not classified as an endangered species? <laughs> if it's classified as an endangered species, does that mean that we have to all of a sudden change all of our laws to accommodate it? Does it mean that wherever it's going to go in, in the environment, in the world, that all of a sudden all of the different obstacles put in place to do anything there by the Endangered Species Act are going to apply to this particular thing? Is that what's going to happen if it's an endangered species? On the other hand, you know, if, if, if there aren't those particular laws to protect it because it's not an endangered species or something else, do we have to come up with a whole new suite of laws that are designed just for an endangered species? And we know that our government works really well and quickly, right? So this is going to be something that's going to be really easy to take care of. And if it's not 
unendangered species, is it actually a genetically modified organism? And is that another suite of problems that we're going to have to deal with? I mean, if it's a GMO, that means it can't cross international boundaries, right? So there's a whole other kind of crazy suite of laws and resources that we're going to have to deal with, right? If it's a GMO, does that mean that people in Europe are going to hate it, but we're not going to care about it? I mean, what? what? I don't understand like, how these things are actually going to happen. Oh, boy. This is a good one, right? Yeah. So if you bring back an endangered species, does that mean that you own the patent, or the university, if you're us, right? Does that mean the university owns the patent on this particular endangered species? Can you use this idea to actually try to get money to do this, right? Can I say, oh, I'm going to bring back Stellar's sea cow, but it's only going to be 2% Stellar's. How about Brin's sea cow? What do you think? Yeah? Okay. I don't know. You know, can you use this as an opportunity to actually generate money to do this? And if you can patent it, what are the consequences? I mean, what does that really mean? I think, and you know, there's um, the Supreme Court has recently ruled on whether or not you can patent genes, but is it going to rule about whether or not you can patent entire organisms that are part manufactured and part something that used to exist? This is just the GMO thing, right? Okay, I'm getting ahead of myself here. Okay, uh, from a more logical, kind of less ranting perspective, how is it actually going to affect the existing community that's there? If you have an ecosystem that is precariously balanced given today's modern society and the way that we deal with things, how is sticking something that's gone from there going to affect that? Is it going to change the balance of resources that are already there? If it's a predator, are we going to even want to tolerate that? I mean, are we going to be really happy if all of a sudden we bring back a 16-foot-tall bear to wander around the streets of Santa Cruz? Is that something that we really want? How about a saber-toothed cat? They used to live around here, you know? It would be really great to have a saber-toothed cat really take care of the poodle problem we've got. Right? <laughs> and one of the most common complaints we have about the extinction or people who are opposed to the extinction are that it's going to take money and resources away from conservation. And I would argue that in the early stages of de extinction, at least this isn't true, most of the funding that would go to support de extinction efforts is actually not supporting de extinction. All of these different uh, technical hurdles and developments that we need to get through in order to do these first stages are being funded for human medical research. You know, we need to do genome editing and genome engineering. We need to improve sequencing technologies and we need to improve genome assembly and this is not going to be funded to do de-extinction but it's going to happen because it's funded to do other things but then what happens if we actually have something who's going to pay for actually putting that thing back into the environment and maintaining it there do you know how much it costs per california condor per year anybody read that something like thirty thousand dollars per bird per year pretty crazy huh Who's going to pay for that? Is it going to take money away from conservation resources? Probably. Probably, when we get to the stage where we have to release it, but certainly not in the early stages. So given that, is it silly? I mean, we do live in a time of the world where we have limited resources to go for science in general and for conservation in particular, right? So is this a silly idea, something that is just too, too prohibitively expensive right now to actually go through? And finally, given that we do have to think a little bit about animal welfare when we're doing this, is it possible with many of these different species to identify the appropriate surrogates, moms, that we would need to carry these things to terms? Do we think about birds? This is a good thing about birds, right? Eggs, not moms. So that potentially is a, a better thing. Only we can't clone birds. We don't know how to do somatic cell nuclear transfer with birds, so that's a step back in that direction. Just more of the animal welfare stuff. Okay, so finally, just as a last point, you know, this is, it, this is, it is taking our energy and our resources away from things that, uh, that, that m many people might find most, more pressing. Um, is this really taking energy and resources and, and just our, our attention away from things that are actually probably more deserving of these things at the time? And uh, I just to kind of give our, give us a little bit of a of a boost now that I've ended up at the downer note. We are uh, working with a couple different conservation groups to use some of these genome engineering and genome editing technologies to try to give a genetic boost to populations that are really low in genetic diversity. So instead of using this technology to bring something extinct back, why not identify diversity that used to exist in populations that right now are suffering from very small population sizes and very little genetic diversity and re-engineer diversity into these populations. And this is something that the exact same technology can go toward and a lot of people can feel a lot happier about, right? So we are also working on these things. So 
in the end, I say, should we? And open it up to you guys. Should we? Thank you. Ben? <laughs> I, just, I just assumed you'd have a comment. <laughs> People can read my comments in the press. <laughs> Else. <laughs> I'm kidding, Ben. <laughs> Ben's actually doing great work in the lab. He has sequenced uh, a whole bunch of passenger pigeons, and we found a few that are incredibly well preserved, and we've sent them off to sequence their complete genomes. So we should have uh, pretty soon a complete passenger pigeon genome. To step one in here, try to figure out what's different between the passenger pigeon and the band tail pigeon. And Andre is working on this as well, sorry. <laughs> Yes. Seems to me that there are a whole range of questions here. One is, is what what we should permit, what we should support with public money, what we should try to prohibit, what what we should try to promote, um, and, and it's like yeah, there's there probably some goofy billionaire who's going to try to do this anyway, no matter what we do, and and we won't do anything about it until until after we find out he's done it. Sure, I think that's one of the nicest things about having this discussion way before it's possible to do this, is that we can, I mean, this is really a, an area of, of science that isn't really science, because we can't do it. It's being moved ahead by the press. We're having this conversation about de-extinction before it's possible, so people can get freaked out and try to figure out what they would need to do when this happens before it actually happens, which is kind of rare in science, isn't it? I mean, it's a, uh, it's one of these awkward situations where we can plan ahead for something. And yeah, I totally agree that the, the probability that we're going to clone an extinct animal and bring it back to life in the next five years is almost zero percent. The probability that someone is going to claim to have done it in the next five years is probably 100%. And it's going to be somebody who inserts a gene into an elephant that makes it adapted to cold or makes it have longer hair. And they're going to say, we've cloned a mammoth. And the press is going to say, we've cloned a mammoth. And only you guys are going to know that they didn't clone a mammoth. <laughs> right? So keep that in mind when you read that. Right? We're going to do it. <laughs> but... Uh, yeah, so who gets to choose? Who has to deal with it? I mean, somebody's going to do it, and everyone's going to have to feel, deal with the fallout of having done it. So, yeah, it's a great question. How do we decide? Well, I, we did a, a class, just said, we did a, a, a class um, uh, in the fall at UC Santa Cruz with graduate students about uh, what, about de extinction. And, and, and one of the first things that we did was everybody selected a species that they wanted to bring back from the dead, and we discussed the negative aspects of each of these different things, and, and we, we discovered that the, the one thing that makes us want to bring something back is guilt. If we made it go extinct, then we think it's okay if we bring it back, and the most important thing about it that we don't want to happen is we don't want it to annoy us. <laughs> so, we don't want to bring anything back that will get in the way of us living our lives the way we want to live it. So, if it lives in a place that would annoy us, we don't want to bring it back. If it eats something that would annoy us, we, we don't want to bring it back. If it, if it, if it uh, you know, flies somewhere in massive flocks of billions and poos on our cars a lot, we don't want to bring it back. Unless we're Ben. <laughs> You know, we like the idea of the mammoth because we think we can stick it in Siberia and ignore it, right? It's a good thing to bring back because it's not going to annoy us, right? But pretty much anything else we can think of is annoying in some way. It, nobody wants to bring back a predator because how annoying would that be? We've already killed them once. Thank <laughs> you, so I had two things. One thing is I think of there's a fascination with bringing back something from the past, a little bit like a Frankenstein impulse that might, it's a totally different realm of human desire than trying to protect species that are around right now. And the other thing I wanted to say is if we bring back something extinct, I could see two possibilities. One is that it's pretty competitive in the ecosystem and then it becomes maybe an invasive species, or it's not competitive in the ecosystem and then it becomes... Extinct. Uh, extinct. And it's, not able to, it's not able to compete, so it's, it's just going to go extinct again. Would that be re extinct? Re extinction. Re -extinction. <laughs> <laughs> They'll live in zoos. If you bring back you know, something that the press calls a mammoth, it'll be in some zoo somewhere. 
Do you think that's yeah. a good enough reason to bring something back? I mean, it, there's this, <laughs> should we bring something back so we can stick it in a zoo and stare at it? I mean, this is a people will feel like we're we like you know the Frankenstein thing, almost like we're God. Like, wow, we brought this thing back. Yes, but then it doesn't. I mean, really, when we have this discussion, the one thing that people use to justify the extinction, if they think about it, is this feeling of guilt. They want to make up for the fact that they or their ancestors and them and guilt by association are responsible for making it go extinct. Bringing something back and sticking it in a zoo does not relieve people of their guilt. That would not be sufficient. I mean, that's the way that the, it's been perceived. Um, that if you stick something in a zoo, it just makes you feel worse about having done it, which is not a, not, not a good way to, to kind of solve your guilt. So personally, you want to bring back? I want back. to bring back the mega predators because, in a way, it's annoying. But in another way, it solves the traffic problem. <laughs> getting over the hill every day. But on a serious note, serious which note, mega predator would you like to bring back, Chris? A short-faced bear and a saber-toothed cat would be really nice. Three rex anacers in the mountain. But only if they glow in the dark. <laughs> That's really important. Sorry. Well, fortunately, we know how to put we green to fluorescent protein in cells, so we can make mega predators that glow in the dark. <laughs> but on a more serious note, I mean, you work in in evolutionary biology, and what do you think the ultimate result of move, removing all these natural selection pressures on humans is going to be? Where do we end up from that? Where we are right now? <laughs> no. Yeah in another 20 years. Where we are right now. <laughs> We've removed all the... the well, there aren't any predators that are after us. And, <laughs> except for that dog. <laughs> Watch yourself. <laughs> what about vaccines? What about... You want me to come up with a mammoth vaccine? Or an anti hyper hypercarnivorous short face bear vaccine? <laughs> No, no, no. I know, I know what you mean, Chris. Sorry. Um, I think you know we we killed we killed a lot of things, and we we make the, the earth what it wants to be, and we just have to kind of we have to deal with that. I mean, we have we have big brains, and we we manipulate our environment, and this is just part of our evolutionary trajectory, right? But now we have the capacity to think about what we might do to actually stop ourselves from destroying what we know today, and even think about bringing things back. And this is also part of our evolutionary trajectory. We have a big responsibility with our big brains. <laughs> Just a, a meta question is, when you took the survey of people who wanted to bring things back, was it more people wanted to bring things back within the last century or two, or was it more people wanted to bring back the ancient stuff? I don't think I've had enough people to be able to answer that question. I would say that... Um, I've been to a lot of schools talking about this, and most kids just get really sad when I say no dinosaurs. Um, <laughs> apart from that, it's, it really is things that we are sure, and I don't know if people are doing this consciously or not, things that we are sure we are responsible for the extinction of. Um, so it's always things like the dodo, or the moa, or the mammoth, or um, things that have gone extinct very recently, like the passenger pigeon. Things that, that we feel the responsibility for ending their existence on Earth. Those tend to be the things that people focus on. Jake? Um, the one reason that you didn't really list is the one that Long now really harps on, which is uh, conservation. Justification. So, passenger pigeon could be great for restoring eastern and midwestern hardwood forests. I don't believe that at all. I don't think we know anything about the diet of the passenger pigeon enough. I mean, we have a, an ecosystem that's relatively stable right now. If we bring back something that you need billions of individuals, there's no way that they can that the current ecosystem, the present day ecosystem, is going to be maintained. I think that bringing something back changes the ecosystem. I think that there is one way. If you have something that's really recently extinct. You know, if you've identified a, a keystone animal in a particular environment, and a good example of this is kangaroo rats, right? Kangaroo rats are going extinct across the desert southwest, and there's lots of research that shows that they're keystone herbivores in their, in their little environments. They turn up the dirt, they move the seeds around, and as soon as they're gone, it can take, you know, less than a decade, and you've changed a desert area into a tall grassland because they've completely changed the environment that's there, and a lot of the species that existed in that environment are gone. So if you could find a location where these guys are very recently extinct in the habitat, 
habitat still exists and put them back in there, then yes, maybe you can use that to conserve that habitat the way it was. But bringing something back that's been extinct for several hundred years, where the habitat has moved on without them, and putting them into that habitat is not going to conserve the habitat. It's going to change the habitat. Yes? Well, there's controversy about genetic modification of anything, I'd say, but there's less controversy about manipulating things that still exist and habitats that still exist than there is about bringing things back that don't exist and sticking them into habitats that already have kind of functional communities. It's a good question. Yes. George Church, uh, with whom I have a lot of disagreements, talks about neo mammoths. And he's even talked about neo-Neanderthals, which is, I think, honest of him. Yeah. Um, but it raises the question, and I'm wondering if this is where the conversation's going to go, about deliberately making novel species. Yeah, well, you know, George is... <laughs> he's absolutely right that when he's using CRISPR technology or any of these different things, he's not making a mammoth. He's making something that approximates a mammoth using an elephant as a as a baseline. So it is going to be something different. I, I think, you know, I, George has been involved in a lot of this stuff and is actually working on some of these projects with us. And, you know, he's crazy in a good way and uh, <laughs> has a lot of, of ideas. And I think it's really nice that he's honest about what it is. And I, I think that that is, is deeply refreshing. When he and I that he's the first person who says that he's cloned a mammoth, says that he clones a mammoth, right? He will say, it's a neo-mammoth, it's not a mammoth. And that is honest. And that will allow the conversation to go on then to, well, what is it? Is it a genetically modified organism? Or is it something that is now protected as an endangered species? And this is an enormous dichotomy, legal dichotomy, right? And how this thing can be treated and managed and moved around and where it can go and how it can be released and then how it can be managed after it's released is how that decision is made. And I think that is still unknown. That's a big, deep, open, important question. Yes. Uh, one, two, three. Yes, you. Yeah, it seems to me as we get the technology, as the technology becomes more and more sophisticated and we get closer and closer to actually being able to do de-extinction, you know, get, get closer and closer, that that technology will be used for so many other things that de-extinction will be the least of our problems and not a very important issue. You think the technology is going to be used for evil? Not necessarily evil, but you know, potentially, yeah. but just yeah. Yeah, ubiquitously. But the technology is going to develop without de-extinction. I think de-extinction is one of these oh, side effects that technology is going to be used absolutely. for. But I'm saying it's, it's a much bigger issue than that. It will affect everything. Sure, and it already is. Yeah. But only in a limited way compared to what will be happening. Techno technology, you know, the, yeah. we, we march forward, oh, on, backward, sure. over. <laughs> yeah. Beth, can you tell us something about how you got into de-extinction? Did you want to bring species yeah. back? Or why de-extinction for you? <laughs> <laughs> I got into it because every time I publish a paper, the press wants to know when I'm going to clone a mammoth. And you just get tired of answering the same question without really thinking deeply about the answer. And uh, just got involved in a discussion with the people at the Long Now Foundation and moved into this. And it's, um, I, I'm fascinated by it. I think it's a, a, an interesting question that deserves public attention and discussion before we can do it. I also think it's important to have a... a a voice of logic and reason out there who's actually involved with the movement who can say over and over again we can't do it you know this is a uh, be careful with what you say and uh, there are several of us out there but I would say the majority of people pushing the extinction are just so excited about it that they're not really looking at it with a more logical perspective yes Way back at the beginning of your talk, you talked about the oldest DNA that we have been able to to extract and deal with. Can you just tell me a little more about that? We found a horse um, metapodial, it's a hand bone from a horse, so the third thing that's, that's down. Um, 
in a bit of the permafrost in the Yukon Territory that was beneath a volcanic eruption that we know happened about uh, 680,000 years ago, but above a, a layer that is magnetically normal. So the last time that the, the magnetic poles were reversed was about 785,000 years ago, and we can tell when soils are that old because the magnetic minerals in the soils are reversed. They show the opposite polarity. So we know that that bone was somewhere between 780 and about six 700,000 years old. And um, with colleagues at the University of Copenhagen, we extracted DNA and sequenced a ton of genetic material from this thing. It managed to piece together a complete genome, and it's just a horse. It's the same kind of horse that we many, 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 many years later